I'd like to introduce uh, to you Natalie Turner. She's an international keynote speaker. She is uh, a speaker on innovation, experience, business facilitator, trainer, and consultant. She is the author of Yes, You Can Innovate. Originally from the UK, Natalie now lives in Malaysia and works out of Singapore and travels the world, inspiring people to live on purpose and to reach their innovation potential. Anyone here want to reach your innovation potential today? All right, let's welcome Natalie up to the stage. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Wow, what a crowd. Well, I'm going to start with a very cheeky photograph. Still, can you see the same smile? Yeah. I was eight years old here on this photograph. And I was eight years old when I gave my first speech. My parents were global faith healers and teachers. So I was brought up in the preaching and the teaching tradition. And it was a Saturday morning, and I was on the streets outside of W.H. Smith's in England, part of our local church outreach to the town. And the wind was howling, and shoppers were going in and out of the shops, more interested in what they needed to buy than listening to a young girl talk about faith and hope and love and making a difference. But actually, a few people did stop. And in that moment, I was amazed at the power of words to stop people in their tracks, even on a really busy Saturday morning in the wind. And people were listening. And it started to make me really think about my own personal story as I crafted and developed and really agonized and thought around this speech for today. So I'd like you to be thinking about your own story as much as me telling you a little bit about mine and how my, my story has evolved and developed. And the other thing I've really been thinking about is the power of words. The power of words to really make a difference in people's lives, whether they're written words or spoken words. The power for us to be able to inspire people, to galvanize people, to move people, to do something different. So we know that the theme for this convention is speak the future, but what type of future do we really want to create? And what is our role, our purpose, collectively as speakers in this time of change? If we look historically at great speakers, people who have changed the world, and it's not just speakers, it's writers and authors and philosophers and poets and artists and musicians, they all have one thing in common. They're able to move people. They're able to affect people's thinking so that they can change and do something different. But I don't know about you, but I feel right now we're sort of living in this time of ideological bankruptcy. We only have to read the news, watch the news, look around us to see this dearth, this absence of really having something strong to believe in to go for, and the beliefs that we have created, the political ideologies, um, they're, they're around us, they're crumbling. We, you know, even the ones we fought, fought for and believed in are crumbling around us. And instead, what we've got is political slogans that basically are hearkening back to a past, this golden past that didn't really even exist. And so as the world is searching for meaning, it starts to regress. It's regressing into tribalism, dualism, world views that no longer serve a very changed planet. And I think this is one of the big challenges, really, of our time. As human beings, we've dominated, we've plundered, 
We've created both the mess and the beauty in which we live. And unless our thinking evolves and adapts to this time of change, then it is actually looking quite bleak. And it's in this vacuum, as people are looking for answers, that words, words come. Words that are spoken, words that are written, they fill the vacuum. But truth itself, as we know, is really under threat. Objectivity. We don't even know if we can believe what we are seeing and what we are reading. Where algorithms and technologies can sway opinion on such a mass scale right now. It's who do we believe in and what do we believe in? Trust in institutions is at an all-time low. So the words that we do speak become even more important because of that. Whether we're writing those words, whether we're speaking those words, the fact that there's, there's 270 people in this room full of great intent. We want to change the world. We want to be able to make a difference. The words that we speak just think of the impact that they can now have on the world. A few years ago, I did a very in-depth program of study based on the work of Dr. Claire Graves. He was an American social psychologist that studied human psychology and cultural development. And from his work and from his research, he noticed that as human beings evolved over time, over history, their thinking evolved to match their circumstances. Mind capacities, the way that we think, the way that we make meaning evolved as our life changed. And when there's the perfect match, if you like, of those things, we feel we can cope. But if our mind capacities are not evolving at the rate of our life circumstances, then we start to go into chaos. We start to lose a sense of meaning and sense-making for ourselves. And I think that this is the challenge of our time. Up until modern history, time was rather slow. You know, things were evolving and we had time to adapt to change. But now, things are rapidly moving and shaking and changing, and it's like being behind this umbrella of things hitting us. And our psychology, our evolution of our mind, isn't going at the same pace as our life circumstances. So we've got this disjoint between the two. So what happens then? We start to either regress, going back, hearkening back to the old days where we felt safe and secure. Or we keep on doing what we're doing, maybe a little bit differently, to try and bridge that gap. But this isn't really serving us. This isn't helping us right now. World views that aren't taking into consideration the complexities of global economies and political systems, and most of all, the suffering and weeping earth are not going to serve us right now. But I think within this, there lies a great opportunity. We may be at the first time in history when human beings, because of our technological and cultural advancement, we can collectively imagine a very different future. We can imagine different ways of working. We can imagine different organizational structures. We can imagine different political ways of engaging life. And in fact, we have to, because the ideas that we've had are not going to take us forward. They're not going to help just human beings flourish, but we know the Earth itself. So what is the purpose of the speaker in this time, in this time of history? I think our purpose is to elevate, to inspire, to use the power of story, of empathy, of pathos, 
ethos, logos, that great rhetorical triangle to move people, to move individuals, to move societies from A to C through a journey of transformation and change. And this is where we need to craft new stories. But what is this gap that we need to bridge? Where is it that we need to speak the future? We've all got different domain expertise in this room. We've got different experiences. We've got different life histories and stories. So what does it mean, and I'd really like you to be thinking about this, what does it mean to speak the future into your domain? The, the domain that pulls you, that calls you. So when I think of myself, I, I mean, it's interesting, you know, working on developing this and, and thinking about my own story, I've always been called towards innovation in one guise or another. Whether it's corporate innovation or as an entrepreneur, in startups, venture capital, working in bringing new ideas to life getting ideas and bringing those ideas to life. And I've spent my, my career in many different guises in this field of innovation. And I published a book last year, Yes, You Can Innovate, based on an innovation methodology that I created called the Six Eyes of Innovation. And you can see at the center of the six eyes is purpose. Why? Why are we innovating even in the first place? And it was interesting, when I created this originally, I was thinking more about purpose for projects, purpose for teams, purpose for an organization in terms of what's driving it. But I've been thinking more and more recently about what is the bigger speech, in a sense, that I need to speak about. And I think it's the innovator's purpose. You know, we get so caught up in the act of innovating but I think we forget about why we're innovating and what's actually driving that forwards. And we know that there's this big confluence occurring between biochemistry, neuroscience, information technologies, and our world is changing. And it will change whether we like it or not in that regard. But if we're not thinking about the outcome, if we're not thinking about the environment, the cultural environments in which that lands, then we are leaving it up to chance. This world, this fourth industrial revolution of which we are a part, we're leaving it up to chance. This makes psychology even more important in terms of how we think and how we invent and how we create. And if we're continuing just to sort of think about why we innovate is all about, you know, um, creating more growth or productivity or efficiency, whilst these things are, are very important, are they really going to lead us into the future? Are they really going to help transform us? And if we continue to just measure our own success purely on profit, then we're not going to be able to deal with the complexities of our time. And this is difficult because there's no easy answers. It calls us to grapple with complexity and relativism. And we don't like that because it's too vague. We want these firm answers and it's this way or that way. But this is really, I believe, what we're, we're being called to do. And what I'm being called to do, as I work with organizations in, in trying to help them to innovate. So this goes beyond digital transformation. Actually, really what we're looking at now is psychological disruption. And I think that's going to be increasing as more and more of the, these new things are coming into our environments. And in a way, what we have to do within that is learn how to stand in the gap for people, to hold that space for people, to, to uh, enable them to go through these journeys of transformation. Going back to my story, I, I experienced probably the first quite big disruption in my own psychology, in my own belief system. Remember, I was brought up by faith healers. I had a very unconventional upbringing. It was great listening earlier to Dolly and her story. You know, my parents took me out of school. And that was a long time ago, that was 40 years ago, can you imagine? They took me out, out of school and we travelled around and uh, they were preaching and teaching around the world. And then when I was 19, I went to work in Bogota, in Colombia, with street children. And it was there that I, I really 
was confronted in terms of my own belief systems. Because faith teaches are very much, this is the way. This is the way you've got to believe. This is the way you've got to, you've got to live your life. And working in Bogota, seeing children shot under bridges at night, babies drinking Coca-Cola mixed a little bit with milk in, in their shanty towns, walking in and, and seeing a, a dead baby and the father saying, don't worry, we'll have another one. I saw so much things that confronted my own reality and I couldn't make sense anymore. Things didn't make sense anymore. And so I went on my own journey of looking at different types of content, different types of beliefs. I, I studied the South American priests, the Jesuit priests of liberation theology in South America. Then I went to study politics and became a speechwriter for the Labour Party. Then I studied economics, development economics and social psychology and got more into thinking about how do we export democratic systems and work within politics. And then I started to work more into business. So it's like I was on a search, and I think we've all had these types of journeys where we're seeking and searching for answers. But oftentimes we're seeking for those answers in the same psychological construct in which we had before. It's like we're replacing a content into the same container. And we know now that what the most sought-after skills are that organizations are looking for is this ability to adapt, this ability to change, this ability to think laterally and creatively to solve complex problems. And here, hearing that even on the panel today, the ability to build relationships, to empathize, to understand, these are the things, but they're not textbook subjects. They're not things that we can just learn in school, or we can learn in college. They're things that we have to go through in terms of life. In a way, we have to go on our own hero's journey. We have to have our own dark night of the soul and be with other people as they go through theirs and experience their own forms of disruption. So when I think of this in the context of innovation, I think of the paradigm shift, really, that needs to occur. It's not just about product innovation or service innovation or process innovation. It's actually more about cultural and societal innovation. It's thinking more about the container in which these things are emerging and growing and really spending some time thinking about that. You know, as speakers, we now have a proliferation of platforms that we can use, that we can deploy for our messages. Wow, what a responsibility. What an opportunity for us to be able to share our words, to write our words, to affect change, to affect transformation. And in fact, I think we need to be thinking about this more. We need to be consciously thinking about what type of words we're putting out into the atmosphere that artificial intelligence technologies can take. You know, we need to be thinking about these aspects because we need to help our cultures grow. The cultures in which we work to grow, uh, grow and to evolve. If we think of human beings, we are master storytellers. We are great culture builders, fiction writers. Think of the things that we've invented. Legal systems, political systems, language, culture, even money. We've created all these things are inventions. They're inventions, they're innovations that human beings have created over time. Now, if that is true, then if this is fiction, even if it's powerful fiction, it can be rethought. It can be reimagined, and in fact, we have to rethink and reimagine it in order for us to take things forward in time. I just got back from Sweden. I was there uh, launching my book with some Swedish partners in Stockholm. And, you know, I literally felt that I'd arrived on a different planet. <laughs> I haven't been to Stockholm for a while. Um, and it was just such a, a, an awakening. I was just in ordinary discussions with people, they're talking about food sourcing. How far is the food travel that's on their plate? Are there alternative forms of transport that people could be taking rather than flying? 
And the recycling bins had so many different compartments, I was, I was dizzy and confused looking at them. And I had to get my friend to explain you know, which, which type of thing goes into to, to what. And then there was Greta. Greta, a 16 year old child who's now become quite a global phenomenon as a speaker. And if you haven't seen her TEDx um, talk, then I really recommend it. She did it last year in Stockholm. And she's sort of leading this rallying strikes around the world with school, school kids. There seems to be a theme today. You know, children are coming up, the youth keep coming up in, in our different speeches. But she's really spearheading this campaign to say, how come older people, us, aren't seeing just how desperate things are? Why isn't it on the headlines every day? And, and it just hit, listening to her speak is just quite an inspiration. And I think, you know, when we think of from a Gravesian perspective, if you remember Claire Graves, you know, he, he was looking and studying different levels of psychological development. Children are being born into a time of psychological de development that's, that's higher than our, what we were born into, or what our parents were born into. And so I actually think we're going to see more and more child speakers. I actually think we need more children speaking, young people speaking. And it's great that APSS are actually starting something around this in order to skill up children with more speaking skills. So you may speak about branding, you may speak about leadership, or innovation, or creativity, or change, or service, or customer service, whatever it is. But what's the bigger speech? If we put it into the collective view of where we are now, what's the bigger speech that may be emerging inside of you? And when you think of your own personal story, how does it fit within the collective that we're part of? And one way I like to think about this is that we, we may we have two speeches, we may, we may have more, but if I think, think of the two things that are calling me into my domain, innovation, change, creativity, we have a small message and a big message. The small message is practical, it's applied, it's how to, it helps people know and have tools and ways of doing things to make things work. And the big speech is more why. How does this fit into the bigger picture of what we're trying to do collectively as a human species right now? So if I think of myself, yes, you can innovate. My book and the work that we do as a, as a business is all around equipping organizations with tools and practical approaches on how to innovate. And the big speech, the big purpose, if you like, is the innovator's purpose. Why? Why are we doing this? You know, if we're going to lead change, if we're going to take organizations forward into the future, then we need to be thinking more deeply and grappling with some of the complexity around this. And I think that part of our role is to challenge ourselves, to deeply challenge ourselves, and also to challenge other people around this, so that we can start to create and think about the types of values that we want to invent and innovate within. What if our voices, are not our own? What if our voices are part of the collective creative impulse that's surging through us, that wants to create a better world, a more harmonious world, a more beautiful world? What if that is really the case? What if we get up every morning and we don't just think, oh, how am I going to do this or how am I going to say this, but really think from a deeper place of our voice being part of something more, a greater collective word, speech, written piece of communication. So find your red thread, you know, the thing that runs through you. Or as Frederick Caron says, our, our president of APSS, your inner theme, your inner theme. Because that is you, that is you. That is your being, that is your purpose, and radiate it, radiate it through your gifts, your talents, out into the world so that you can impact people and that they can be inspired to take change and to take courageous action. 
So I've got three practical things that I really want you to think about and then we'll have a time to just be able to think about well, what is emerging in you right now. Wherever you are in your speaking career, if you're already playing the game at a very high level, if you're exploring whether you want to do it, or if you're a speaker just in your organisation, it doesn't matter. We are all communicators. And we can all get better at communicating. But if we can tap into this inner theme, this inner story, this inner purpose, then we're going to be able to affect bigger, bigger systemic change. So what's first? First, I think, and it was great hearing the first speech today around the big picture, being educated. Being educated with real data, real research that can open and expand our mind and, and, and challenge our own assumptions because we've got, we've got so much stuff that's hitting us. Now, it isn't true. And regressive thinking and worldviews that are out of date and I think really to just study the domains in which we each work. If we're on the evolving edge of these domains, where are they going next? If we're going to speak the future from the domain in which we inhabit, which we're called to, which calls our emotional heart, our passion, then how are we going to help to evolve it to the next level? Secondly, we've got to deeply understand the people who are listening to us. Where are they? What's their context? What are the struggles? What's the psychological constructs, constructs that, their, that their culture, organizational, societal, national, sits within? Where are they? And how does this bigger picture relate to that so that we can act like a bridge, like a liaison between where they are and where they may want to go or need to go? Thirdly, and maybe most difficult is really to deeply understand ourselves, to spend time, to understand our own behavioural patterns, to understand our own thoughts, our personalities, how it's been shaped, how our identity has been shaped, how we trip ourselves up all the time with the construct of who we are. And to live mindful and soulful lives. Lives where we can know that thoughts, no matter how strong or powerful they are, are impulses. They're impulses passing through. They're not us. They can create amazing things, they can create terrible things. But to just understand that thoughts are transitory moments that are passing through us, and to really live from that place of mindfulness and a soulfully driven life. So I started this with looking at my story and, and I've been thinking a lot about, about my story and of course the content about what I speak has changed. My religious and spiritual beliefs have changed. I hope so, you know, 40 odd years have gone by since, since, since I was on the, the, the streets preaching. But I'll tell you what's the same and I have been feeling this a lot. I'm feeling the evangelical fervor rising. I'm feeling that passion. I'm feeling that need to preach. <laughs> and, and that I've had all my life, but it's only now it's starting to really, really grow inside of me. So think about your own story. Think about those things that have formed you, have shaped you, have created you. And my parents were crazy. They still are. They're in their 80s. They're, they are the most curious explorers. My father's going to be 85 this year. He's still going around the world doing his thing, starting stuff. Thank God I have parents like that. And if you are a parent, think about. Think about what type of environment you're raising your kids in. Take them out of school. Get them on a bus. <laughs> get them around the world. Break conventions. Because that is how you'll shape them. That is how you're going to shape how they think when they're older. So, the power of words. The power of words, the written and the spoken words, the galvanized change to enable other people to take that courageous action. So do you believe you are a messenger? Do you believe you are a messenger? Yeah. Yes! 
<laughs> I hope you believe you're a messenger. Do you believe you're born for such a time as this? Yeah! Absolutely. And so what is the biggest speech inside of you that is yet to emerge? What is that authentic, passionate, empathetic speech that is desiring to come out? Because you probably know it. You're probably being pulled towards it. Because this isn't just about us as individuals. This is collective. This is collective psychological change. And as speakers, we can call it transference. It's like in the moment of the blink of an eye, the lightness of being, we are transformed. We change. We change. Insight happens in the mind. So we need different storytellers. We need new stories. We need to craft new narratives that give hope, that give direction, that give people a something to believe in as we struggle with complexity and move towards the future. We need more communicators, more leaders, more managers, leaders and speakers nearer to sustainability, diversity, community, connectivity, beauty, warmth, so that we can create this new earth that we're now moving into. So this goes beyond digital transformation. I'm talking here about psychological and societal transformation and innovation at the level of thought. And it starts with the word, the courageous written and spoken word. Thank you very much. Yeah.